let's get started. Uh, we're going to start with our first presentation today. It is from Pete Brown from Microsoft, who is not only works for Microsoft, but he is also the chair of the Media Association Executive Board and does a great job doing that. Please welcome to the stage, Pete Brown. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Uh, so hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, definitely put on the headphones because there's tons of extra noise around here, right? Uh, yeah, make sure you turn them on. They need to be blue. Okay. So I'm going to talk today about uh, a project that we've been working on at Microsoft for a while now, and that's going to ship later this year, and that is Windows MIDI services. And this is our next generation MIDI 2.0 and MIDI 1.0 stack for Windows. Okay. So we had a, a number of uh, different requests from customers, right? Uh, how many of you have ever tried to uh, use the same MIDI board on Windows from two different applications at the same time, right? And it doesn't work, right? Top request that we have is for multi-client support for MIDI and Windows. We also had report for uh, outbound message scheduling. People want to be able to have their applications send messages out so that they uh, arrive at a specific time. Uh, other operating systems do that. Windows hasn't been doing that. Uh, so it's uh, probably uh, like the number two or number three request uh, that we had. Uh, we always hear that folks want faster performance and lower jitter. Uh, you want the, the Bluetooth MIDI stack actually integrated with the APIs that applications use. Uh, and you want to be able to bring back MIDI mapper type of uh, capabilities. <coughs> Excuse me. And of course, uh, what drove this to begin with is we need to support MIDI 2.0. So here's the problem. Our existing MIDI APIs, the WinMM API, the WinRT APIs, they all talk to uh, code which is older than probably half the developers that I work with at Microsoft. Uh, it's difficult to debug, it's impossible to extend, uh, and it, um, uh, it's just not something that we would be able to support MIDI 2.0 with. And those APIs talk, exist, uh, talk to the existing kernel drivers that are out there, and if you wanted to do any sort of other type of transport, if you wanted to do RTP or if you wanted to do app-to-app -app MIDI or anything, you had to write a kernel driver, and so that really wasn't a great experience. So the solution that we had here is we have a Windows service now as part of our Windows MIDI services, and we have our new MIDI 2.0 API, which talks to that Windows service. And having a Windows service in there gives us a lot of flexibility uh, in terms of what we can accomplish and, and how we can extend this. And then at the same time, we are going to be repointing some of those older APIs, specifically the WinMM API and the WinRT APIs that all the applications use today to this MIDI service so that they can at least continue to function exactly as they do today for a MIDI uh, 1.0 capacity. Then our Windows service uh, talks to different types of plugins that we have running in that service. So we have USB MIDI 1.0 and 2.0 transport plugins that talk to a driver. Uh, we have virtual MIDI or app to app MIDI that talks to a driver, or excuse me, that talks directly to the service there. We're working on rewriting our Bluetooth MIDI 1.0 uh, piece as a plugin for that. And then we're working on other transport plugins. We're also, you know, if you attend some of the other sessions today, we're working on our network MIDI 2.0 implementation in Windows as well, which will also be one of these uh, plugins. And in this case, the only ones that have to talk to a driver are the MIDI, uh, the USB MIDI 1.0 and 2.0. Everything else gets uh, created just as a plugin. So what this means is that if you are a developer and you are prototyping a new type of transport with somebody in the MIDI association, you can write that as a plugin to the service here as a third party using the APIs that we have provided. You don't need to know how to write drivers. You don't need to know how to debug drivers. You can just load that in as a com object and we'll load that in the service. And it makes it super easy for you to be able to take advantage of the, all the infrastructure we've built in there and use these new types of, uh, of, of transports. The other type of plugin that we have in the service is uh, message processing plugins. So we now do data format translation behind the scenes. One of the things that when you take a look at the API, you'll see that it is UMP centric. If you're not familiar with UMP, that is the, the packet that is used for MIDI 2.0 communication. Uh, it, it, um, 
is a nice, well-defined specification of messages that are of a known length, right? Whereas MIDI 1.0 was a number of bytes that got sent down the wire and messages were like one, two, or three bytes or unless they were sysx and there were a whole bunch of bytes there. So there's that translation that does need to take, uh, does need to happen when you plug a MIDI 1.0 device into our service. So the applications talk UMP, the service will translate that to whatever the device requires and we'll do all that behind the scenes so that those devices just work. And in that way, we're trying to support as many of the existing devices and as many of the existing applications that work out there today. The other thing that we've done as plugins here are uh, we have outbound message scheduling. So if an application provides a timestamp for the messages going out, we will do our best to schedule that to go out as close as possible to that timestamp. We're also doing um, jitter reduction time uh, timestamps, which is part of the MIDI 2.0 specification. All that handling, that clock generation, uh, all of the work we're doing there is part of uh, those those um, uh, plugins. The other things that are happening there is that's also where we're doing MIDI mapper type stuff. So we've had requests for automatically translating something like a node on message with a uh, velocity of zero to a node off because certain devices out there don't uh, respond well uh, to a note on of zero, right? So we can have that as an, op, uh, as an optional plugin for a specific device that when you instantiate that device, we know that plugin needs to run and we do that translation automatically. We can also do things like remap channels, remap notes, remap all those types of things, stuff that you used to be able to do with the MIDI mapper. Okay. So there's a lot more that, that, uh, that we could do in the Windows service here now that we have this in place. And this is really just kind of the start of it. But I will say the, the biggest advantage that we have here now is that the Windows service is a single client to the drivers. So when we're talking even to existing MIDI 1.0 drivers, they will now be able to be multi-client because our Windows service is the client. And then it fans out the messages to all the different applications. So everything that's out there today will just continue to work, but it'll get some additional benefits. So I mentioned a new API and service. Uh, I talked about the timestamp based stuff. It is UMP stream centric. I do want to make sure that folks know, even if you're talking to a MIDI 1.0 device, you're going to talk to it using uh, the, the MIDI 1.0 protocol inside UMP. Uh, we have built in events so that if a uh, device is added or removed from the system or if properties on that device are updated, you can subscribe to those events. And so your application, you don't have to have the, the, the case where the application has to be restarted to know that there are new MIDI devices on the system. We provide notifications for that. We also provide those same notifications for data that we capture like say function blocks. So if a MIDI 2.0 function block changes its properties, which it's allowed to do, or if it moves as different groups or, or whatever, you will get a notification for that in Windows without you having to understand the message. Um, we do provide the message to you if you want it, but if you don't want to have to understand that, you get more friendly events for that. We also have a lot more device properties. Um, right now, today on Windows, you basically get the name for the device. And that's about all that anybody in any application ever knows about the device. So if, if you have a, a um, like a SysX editor or any type of editor for an application, a lot of times it's gonna look for a device with a specific name. I hate that, but it's all that we had available at the time. So now we provide two things that, that are gonna help there. One, users can rename any device in the system, so you can call them what you want, which kind of breaks that model of looking for a device. But two, we provide a lot more information about those devices and endpoints. So we let an application know what was the name that uh, the device itself provided, right? What was the name that was discovered over uh, MIDI 2.0 uh, endpoint notifications? What is the name that the user provided? And that's and we have a hierarchy of which one we display, but we make all those other properties available. We also provide many other properties, which I'll show here, so you can identify the device you want to talk to without having to do kind of weird string searches. So again, we're just trying to get uh, through a lot of the requests that we've had from different developers and users. Uh, I've mentioned uh, some of the parsing stuff that we have. Uh, we also have message builders into the API. So if, you, if you're not sure how to build a MIDI 2.0 channel voice message, we have a builder that helps you do that. Uh, we have filters so that if you want the API to say, 
return only channel voice messages to you. You could set the filter to show only the channel voice messages or set the filter to show only a specific uh, group and only a specific channel. And you can have as many of those on, a, on an endpoint as you would like. So tons and tons of flexibility here. Uh, and then finally, this is all open source. So uh, we have been developing this uh, on GitHub for the past year. Uh, we've been getting lots of feedback from different developers. Uh, if you're familiar with Microsoft, this is kind of new to us. This is, this is not our usual approach, but it's something that we really wanted to do. So the, the uh, MIDI 2.0 driver, which I'll talk about in a second, is open source. The API is fully open source. Uh, the service is fully open source. And then the tools that we provide along with it are also fully open source. So speaking of the class driver, uh, we have a new MIDI 2.0 class driver that is in development. Uh, I have a version of it here on, on my, my workstation today. It combines uh, both MIDI 1.0 and MIDI 2.0. Okay. We're trying to make this the, the, the class driver to rule them all so that companies don't have to build their own drivers. Um, but it is open source so that if, you really, if it really turns out you have to build your own driver, We'd much rather you contribute back to this one, uh, but if you really have to build your own driver, you have the source code out there that you can you can use. It's very permissively licensed. Uh, and a shout out to the, the teams that did this. Um, this driver is actually funded by AME, which is uh, the kind of the Japanese equivalent to the MIDI Association. So we have some representatives from AME here today. I'd like to have a, a big thank you to the AME folks for unblocking that. Thank you. Uh, and the actual developers of the USB MIDI 2 driver are Aminote, which are right over there on the, uh, right behind the MIDI Association booth. Uh, so if you have questions about specifics on the driver, you're, you're welcome to talk to them. But one of the things that this did is it brought expertise from Roland and Yamaha and Korg and Kawai and all those companies that are in Yamaha, uh, excuse me, in uh, uh, Ame, as well as the driver expertise from Aminote and combine that together to make sure that we have the right team for building this uh, class driver in Windows. I, uh, I mentioned some of the things with the uh, transports. Uh, they are the full implementations. Like, so we have uh, diagnostics loopbacks, and I'll, I'm gonna give you a demo here shortly. Uh, we have uh, virtual and app to app MIDI built as part of this. Uh, we're working on the, the kind of routing patch bay because we've been asked, hey, uh, I would really like to be able to mount, uh, you know, uh, take the output from one device and automatically have it feed into the input of another device. So we're working on that. Uh, we have a bridge to USB, to network, uh, to VLE. Those are all in process. And again, this is also open source. I'd already talked uh, about uh, the message processing plugins. Uh, so I'm not gonna go too much about that, except one thing I do wanna mention is that uh, we do metadata capture and processing. So if you're familiar with the MIDI 2.0 protocol, there are some steps for discovery when you plug the device in. So when you plug a USB device into Windows that is a MIDI 2 device, uh, we go and we query that device. We say, hey, tell us about this endpoint. Give us your endpoint name. Give us all the information that, that you have about this endpoint. We get that information back. We cache that with all of our device properties in Windows. And then we say, all right, tell me about your function blocks. And we get all the function block information and we cache that as well in Windows. So individual applications don't have to go and re-request this information all the time. We did it right when it was plugged in uh, to Windows at that point. And then uh, we capture updates as they come across the wire later. And I'll show you an example of that here. So let's look at some of the stuff we have here. Can you all see this okay? A little bit, okay. So we have uh, the MIDI services console, which uh, it comes with Windows MIDI services. And what I did here is I said, you know, tell me about all the endpoints that we have connected up. And what we have, and sorry, my head, my head doesn't make a very good window. Uh, let me uh, actually, oops. Let me make this a little bit bigger. There we go. Uh, so we have, uh, uh, the different endpoints here. In this case, I've got the Roland A88, excuse me, A88 Mark II that's next to me. That is a UMP device. I have uh, an app to app MIDI example in here. And then I also have this, um, uh, another app to app MIDI example in that. So that's just listing all the devices. Uh, if I want to monitor a device, uh, I can say MIDI endpoint monitor, right? 
Uh, and I could pick the AD8MK2, and then I could see all the nodes and stuff that are coming through on that. All right. So if you're familiar with the protocol here, these are telling you that these are MIDI 2 channel voice messages, which are 232 bit words. Uh, and it's coming in on group one, and it's uh, the last couple of, uh, of uh, bytes of that are uh, uh, index and velocity and a bunch of other information, right? So we have that. I can also get a lot of other information from uh, this console tool. This console tool is just using the API as we provide it to applications. So everything that we're doing here can also be done from an application. So I could say MIDI endpoint properties. And I picked that uh, Mark II again. And you can see here, here is the device. And I'll show you again. So uh, we see this is named the A88 Mark II. Again, I could rename this uh, myself. We have uh, some information, some internal information. Uh, we have uh, user supplied information. You can provide uh, for each device on the system or each endpoint on the system, I should say. Uh, you can provide your own name, like I said. You can also provide a description that we provide to applications so they can show you, hey, this is my cool base synth that I use for patches X, Y, and Z. And that information is stored with the rest of the properties that we have here so that, and provides all those applications. Uh, you can also provide uh, a small image and a large image. We have discovered information here. We know that this is a MIDI 2.0 device uh, and it's not currently sending or receiving JR timestamps, which is fine. Uh, and we know it's multi-client and it supports both MIDI uh, 1.0 and MIDI 2.0 protocol. And then we have the captured function blocks. And these are the things that were uh, discovered when we first uh, connected the device. So the first function block we have here is keyboard control. And then we have exterior out and exter uh, external out and external in. And we can see that that first one is a uh, UMP MIDI 2.0 function block bi-directional, and we can see that the second and third ones, which will be the DIN ports on the back here, are MIDI 1.0 jacks uh, that uh, they want uh, some restricted bandwidth so that they adhere to the MIDI 1.0 specification. And again, that's all information that was discovered through the MIDI 2.0 protocol uh, and made available to applications. Okay, so let's go back. So I'm still monitoring uh, this uh, keyboard here, so you can still see that notes are coming through. And rather than just show you, you know, a simple example through our console, I thought I would show you one of the partner applications that we have here. So you all familiar with this app? May have heard of it once or twice. All right, so we have a, a uh, in-development prototype here of Cubase, which is using MIDI 2.0. Uh, they've actually done all the MIDI 2.0 work Previously, because Apple has supported MIDI 2.0 in their operating system for a couple of years now, we're a little bit further behind. So they've been able to have all the, the basics of MIDI 2.0 support, like high resolution and all the other stuff there built into Cubase uh, for some time. Uh, and what they've done here is they've now plumbed this into our MIDI 2.0 API. So if I look at uh, this channel I have here, I see it's uh, going to the A88 Mark II. Now, before I hit record on this, there are many, many, many preview, pre-release, not finished pieces here. So I'm gonna give myself just a little caveat in case this doesn't record through, but let's, let's hope that works. So I'm going to hit record on this. Oh, and there we go. So you see the notes that are coming through here. Beautiful. Always good when that uh, works. Now, if I wanna look at those notes, like how do I know that there's anything special that this is a, a MIDI 2.0 device? So if I go back and look at some of the notes here, like this one, I can see the velocity. You can tell I'm not a piano player because on a scale of one to 100 here, I'm only hitting a 42 for how hard I'm hammering these keys. Uh, but you can see that the velocity for this is 42.175, right? In MIDI 1.0, you were stuck with sub, you know, zero to 127. In MIDI 2.0, we have a much, much wider range of values. So in this case, the, the way that I have chosen to represent these values, it's an option in Cubase here, uh, is from zero to 100 with three decimal points. And they give you one decimal point, two decimal point, or three decimal points, whatever is appropriate for how you would, you would uh, think in this, um, so that you can see the additional resolution. Now, you might think that's not a big deal, but 
the, the difference for a real piano player who is not me between 42.175 and 43 can be a really big deal. Like that is, that is an expressive thing that they, they want to have captured there. And it's not just for uh, note velocity, but it's also for all the different controller messages and everything else. Okay. Have I sold you on MIDI 2.0 yet? It's really awesome. There are people here who know a lot about it that you can check out demos and stuff out of that. All right, so that's uh, Cubase. Again, we've been working with them. Uh, they are, are a good partner for us to, um, uh, to experiment with and stuff here as well. And as part of the MIDI Association, they've been able to have a lot of input on things like how you represent messages and how you represent the different velocity values and everything uh, in, in the protocol specification and with all the different manufacturers. Okay, so we have that. Let me go back to a couple other things here. Actually, let me close Cubase. I'm going to throw away my work. That's terrible. And by the way, I don't know if you noticed, but while Cubase was recording that, they're still showing up on the monitor here as well, which is just another MIDI application. So again, multi-client is what you're seeing there. So I have a second application I want to show. And this is Multitrack Studio from uh, Bremer's Audio Design. I'm going to say, no, I'm using a keyboard and mouse. Okay? And so uh, Multitrack Studio here uh, also works with the MIDI 2.0, the you know, Windows MIDI Services API in Windows. Uh, and it is, um, uh, they've done some interesting things. So for example, if I go under Studio here, and if I look under Devices, they have a lot of different uh, devices that they've listed here. Uh, and so these ones that you're showing at the top, there's, there's lots of it. You don't have to read all of these, uh, but you'll see that each one of those is showing like 16 groups, 16 groups, uh, 16 groups, right? The reason it's showing those is because there's no function block information and no group terminal block information for those. So they don't know which groups are active, which groups are not active. So when you're building a device or you're building an application, you want to make sure you're using that group information to be able to know uh, what groups uh, in Meteor are active. Now, on the other side, if you look, here is the A88 Mark II, and it's showing, sorry, yep, it's showing two function blocks, uh, or excuse me, two uh, endpoints that you can connect to in this application because it read that information from our cached function block information, okay? So they're able to show that. The other thing that you'll see here is see these diagnostic loopbacks? This is something that we've built into Windows MIDI services from the beginning. So even if you don't have a MIDI 2.0 device today, you can start developing by using these loopbacks where just you, you talk to uh, loopback A and it comes in on loopback B and you can monitor the stuff in the, the monitors or between two different applications or however you want to do that. All right, uh, so let me close that part for a second. Uh, one thing that I haven't done here that I want to do is I have an app to app MIDI sample, okay? So this is an example application that I've put together. Super simple. I'm just going to run it right from Visual Studio. And you see here, it's just a, a typical pad controller, okay? And this is app to app MIDI. And what happened here is you saw before there was an endpoint called pad controller. That was for this application to talk to. And I've talked to the Multitrack Studio folks. They know that they won't normally show those types of endpoints to users. But what happens when the application uh, that, ha that owns that endpoint starts up, we go and we, and we talk to that application, we get its function blocks, we get everything else about it, and then we set up another endpoint that's visible to all the other applications out there for them to be able to talk to. Because when you do an app to app MIDI, you have to have some sort of like a loopback uh, process for that but we've dynamically spun up this second endpoint that we will then be able to see inside um, uh, Kiel's uh, application. But before that, uh, I want to do one other thing. I mentioned that uh, we do discovery for uh, some of these applications, or excuse me, some of these endpoints. I'm going to do uh, uh, endpoint properties. And you see this one here, pad controller. It's all the way down. I'm not going to zoom in on that for a second. If we look at this pad control, you see right now there are no def there are no function blocks, and that's just because for the build that I've put out here for today, I'm not discovering function blocks for um, app to app MIDI. 
But what I can do is I can force it to discover them. So I could say uh, MIDI endpoint, and sorry, that's like way down at the bottom of the screen. No. Uh, MIDI endpoint request endpoint metadata slash all. Sorry, and I'm gonna do the pad controller. So I've done that. And then I can also ask for function blocks. So that's all. I'm sorry, my head makes a better door than a window, I know. Uh, do that. All right, and now if I go in and get the properties for the, this again, you will see if all worked well, please work. Uh, maybe it didn't work. Nope, okay, actually didn't work. I knew something would fail up here on screen. It does, actually, you know what's interesting is I do see the function block count. So let me try it one more time on function blocks. Input function blocks all. Head controller. And then let me see one more time. We're gonna have bugs. Yeah, okay. So for some reason my function block didn't come through. That's okay on stage here. It worked the other day, just trust me on that. Uh, what, I'll, what I wanna show you before I actually use that in an application is how I set that up. And inside the code that I have here that uses this, um, that creates this, uh, this uh, pad controller is I have programmatically added function blocks to that just by adding them to the device information when I set up the device. So you as a developer, you don't need to know what are all the different function block messages, what are all the different endpoint notification messages. You're dealing with strong types that you just pass up, uh, and then we, we take that information uh, and create the appropriate messages for you. And so when you have this device set up, anytime we get a function block request, it'll automatically reply to that and provide the function blocks that you've provided. And if you want to update those, you just update those in your view of that, and we will automatically send those out as notifications. Okay? So let me not escape from this yet. But what I do want to show is if we go back to Kiel's application. Now, the function block thing wasn't working, so we'll see if how well this works. But if I go into Studio Devices, if I go to not that pad controller, but if I go, here we go, pad controller, hit okay. And I'm gonna add a track, say MIDI track, track one. Uh, and I'm gonna expand that. Then I'm gonna arm this to record. And we'll see if this records. And in fact, it may not. Let's see here. No, some demos don't work. Let's check that. Yeah, okay, well, so obviously my after that MIDI demo here isn't working today, but those are new bits anyway. Uh, trust me, it does work in most cases and it will work per, uh, perfectly well by the time we ship. So like I said, these are daily dev bits that I'm working on here right now. Alrighty, so that's, uh, that's the basics of what we have for Windows MIDI services. You can see that um, we are able to talk to devices. AppTap MIDI generally works unless you're on stage at NAMM, in which case, of course, it's not going to work. Uh, and then we have uh, the diagnostic loopbacks as well as the tools that we have. I only showed you a few features of that, um, that console tool, but uh, you can use it to record data that comes in from a device. So you can use it to do a sysx dump. You can use it to send a file of data for testing. Uh, so if you're, uh, you know, you want to either send sysx for just doing an update or you want to um, uh, send test data to a device, you can do that. Friends at Yamaha and Roland have been doing that and submitting all the bugs to me. Thank you folks for, for doing that. Um, the, we also have uh, the ability to monitor uh, endpoints as they come and go. So if, you're, if you wanna just set up a window and you wanna test plugging and unplugging a device and see when it appears and see what kind of events you get, we have a way to do that. Uh, bunch of other stuff. You can also send individual messages and send them out uh, as quickly as possible or send them out with a delay or test the scheduling, a bunch of other stuff. So tons and tons of features in there, uh, both for developers, but also for power users. So if you're looking in the future to automate, say, 
sending certain messages over to a, a specific synthesizer for performance and you want to put that in a script, you can script this stuff out and be able to use it that way. So the developer previews are available on GitHub for any developer. We're up to developer preview four. Like I said, we have a lot of partners that have been working with us on that. Uh, if you're a developer, you know, try this out. Even if you don't have a MIDI 2.0 device, go to this link, try it out. Use the loopback endpoints. That's what they're there for so that you can start coding your API against it. Uh, and uh, report bugs. Like we're, we're absolutely interested in anything that you see which um, doesn't work the way that you would expect it to work. Um, this, is a, this is a great opportunity right now for us to be able to address those. As far as customer releases go, so uh, I want to say we, we need to finish testing first, like we need to finish development and finish testing. So we don't have a specific date, uh, you know, down to the day of when we're going to develop or deliver this. Uh, it's going to be later this year, and that date's going to be driven by, you know, when we feel and when our partners feel that this is stable and appropriate for end users to use, and that's when we're going to release it. And with that, I'd just like to say thank you, and... Uh, please uh, visit the repo and join us on our uh, Discord server. Okay, I'm open for questions for the last 15, thanks. Yeah, oh, there we, there we go. Anybody have a question for Pete? Yeah. Um, what is the state of interoper interoperability with, um, software controllers on, say, devices from our friends in Cupertino or on uh, um, Android devices. Um, how do these operate? Uh, how do these communicate with, uh, with MIDI point two and Windows? So let me, let me, let me throw one thing out there. Uh, and then it sounds like Athen has some ideas. So I, I don't speak for any other operating system. Uh, but uh, there is, and which you can join later today, a network protocol, uh, which is the way I would recommend it. Um, as far as Windows goes, is if the device shows up as a USB MIDI 2 class device, uh, then we'll recognize it as stuff. I don't, I don't know. Do the Android devices show up that way? No. So we would most likely it would be network uh, uh, network interrupt for that, which that specification is very close to being finished. Uh, and we had a prototype of it on Windows last year, uh, so that uh, we, had, we, we will have that as well. Yes, so one, one of the things about the MIDI Association that is very cool is, uh, just stand up for a second. Oh, hey, Tori. Tori is here, Tori Walker, um, Pete Brown, and uh, Phil Burke from Google. Uh, we are also supporting Linux. So we have all of the operating systems and we actually have an OS API working group. And I always say this, and I will say it publicly. Uh, you know, the Media Association is one of the few places where you can get Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Linux to agree on something. Uh, and so we're very proud of that, and we're very proud of the great team that we have. MIDI is all about collaboration, and so we work with AME, which is the J Japanese organization. They're actually paying for the, the, the Windows driver to be built. We all put down our comp competitive nature, and then we work together to make it easier for artists and musicians to create really cool things with MIDI. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Other questions? Yeah, sure. Hey, Pete, thanks. Um, hey. Very excited to see this. Uh, question for me, that the spec is obviously huge. What's still to come? Is anything not going to be in the box when you ship in the box? Or do you think you're really gonna have all the big pieces? So for, um, it's a good question. So there, there are some things, that, so first of all, there are two different versions. There's an older version and a newer version of the CI specs and the, the UMP specs. Actually, there's three of the CI, I think, if I remember. Um, so we, we support the latest UMP 1.1 1 .1, uh, specification, I, I believe that. Well, that's the number we report, right? Uh, so is that specification, is it number 1.2 or 1.1? 1 .1? Oh, it's 1.1. Anyway, we support the latest UMP specification, uh, so that's all good. 
What we don't have inside uh, Windows is uh, the earlier MIDI CI discovery and protocol negotiation, and we're not going to implement that because it's not recommended anymore. Um, and just w given the date at which we're implementing it, uh, it doesn't make sense. We also don't currently have any helpers for MIDI CI. That's something that actually Tori and I have discussed, that Phil has discussed, that all of us have discussed in the uh, API working group for different ways for like what's the right thing for that. Um, at least on the Windows side, we don't have that in place yet, but that doesn't stop you from doing MIDI CI because that works perfectly fine over MIDI 1.0 protocol and MIDI 1.0 transports, and you can do that over UMP as well. So we, we wanna do more for that. We just, we probably won't have that in the box. Um, we will have USB support. We'll have virtual support. We'll, we'll most likely have the batch uh, base support. We, we support all of the UMP messages we support function blocks, endpoint uh, discovery, uh, notification, mm -hmm. et cetera. And one thing that we, we've made sure that we do here is if we don't understand a message, as long as that message is the appropriate type. So for example, a type F needs to be 128 uh, bits, right? As long as that is the correct type, we just pass it along. So if we don't understand a message, we just send it along because we want to make sure that people can prototype uh, as well as that uh, you're not blocked by us when a new message type comes out. So. Any, any other questions? Any, any other questions? Sure. Uh, this is kind of related to the question back there, but is there any way for a Windows device to act as like a USB device? So it's obviously a host and can talk to host, but I think like Android phones can do this, like they can be put into a mode where it's like, oh, this is now like a USB MIDI device. Um, can you do that, Andrew? I can, can you bring the mic over to Phil just for a second? Sorry. Uh, Android uh, has a peripheral mode where it can operate as a peripheral to a host, yeah. but that's only for a MIDI 1.0. Okay, thanks. Um, so the question is, can you do that on Windows? Not that I've seen yet, and we're not currently planning to do that. Um, I still think network is going to be the, the right choice for those types of interactions. And it's so close that, um, yeah, I, I think you just get a lot more from that. Yeah, and in terms of network MIDI, you can actually go over, I believe, both the Bonebox and certainly the people from Amino. They have, like, and I think over here as well. Yeah. There, there's lots of prototypes of the network MIDI actually happening. So it's not, it's, I mean... One of the things that we have done, a lot of people ask the question, what have you guys doing, been doing since 2020 when MIDI 2.0 was first announced? Well, you have to remember that in 2020, we, we published a huge amount of specifications, but there was no USB driver, so there was no way to test anything. And then that was in January of 2020, and something happened around March of 2020, which made it a little bit more difficult. Like nobody could travel. We couldn't have plug fest because you couldn't get out of the country you were in. Uh, but what we have been doing for the past three years is we have been prototyping all of the MIDI 2.0 things. We did a major update in June. And because of that, you know, that is why we're at the point where over, um, actually using that keyboard that's on stage with Pete. Uh, there is a working demonstration of the piano profile. Um, it's now, you know, it is eminent to be on Windows. It's already in Apple. It's already on Android. It, the Linux stuff, the also team has been working on it. So it's not even a question. I mean, it's not a question of is MIDI 2.0 going to happen? It is happening and it's happening now. Uh, and um, I think it's pretty cool and pretty exciting. Can I, I, wanted, I wanted to point out one other thing here. Um, if you go over to the Amino booth on the other side, they have a setup, which I'm, I know I'm going to butcher, Michael, sorry, but it's uh, USB on Windows to their network bridge controller, which is using a pre-release uh, version of the, uh, the network protocol to talk to some other keyboard over there, which then goes back over to USB or something like that. So they're doing some really interesting things in that booth to combine these different uh, technologies as well. Uh, so we got to wrap it up because uh, Tori is anxious to get on stage, I know. Um, can, I don't know if you understand how difficult what Pete just did 
for 45 minutes is. <laughs> I mean, that is really difficult to keep all of that information, uh, explain it very articulately and, and somewhat simply. This was geared towards developers. Can we have a round of applause for Pete Brown? He did a great job. Thanks, Pete. Thank you. Thanks.